Hey guys, welcome to System Design Fight Club. I'm going to cover chapter seven of Alex Shu's upcoming machine learning system design book. It is on making an event recommendation system. Uh, that's all I had to go off of for uh, making this, just the title of the chapter. Um, these are some sources that I was looking at for trying to come up with the design. Um, so the requirements that I'm going to go with are that users can sign up for events, users can see events recommended for them, and events can be created. Uh, really, the only uh, core requirement here is this one, that you can see um, recommended events. That might be the only one that's actually used in the book. Uh, so let's talk about the data model. Uh, it's going to be another recommender system. There's a ton of recommendation systems uh, or recommendation engine designs in um, the book. It seems like a lot of the chapters involve a recommender system. Uh, this one will be collaborative filtering, I believe. Um, those can either be item-based or user-based. Um, so the item-based ones are not actually personalized. Um, at least for an item item collaborative filtering approach. Um, so that would make it not acceptable. It would mean that every single person just receives the exact same um, event recommendations. Um, unless uh, you're going off of um, the user, uh, they're, they're signed up for one specific event or they're looking at one specific event and it's supposed to recommend other events related to whatever they just we're looking at right now, um, which would mean that you could solve it with uh, an item item collaborative filtering approach, which is similarly to the one from chapter nine's problem. But that would mean that you have two problems in the book covering uh, roughly the same kind of approach to a problem. So I'm pretty skeptical that it's going to uh, go down that alley for this problem. I'm pretty sure that it's going to be more of a personalized approach. Um, and so uh, since item base would not actually personalize it from what I've read, um, you'd have to go with the user-based approach, which is um, under a, it's uh, with um, a nearest neighbor kind of thing. There's like um, two kind of steps to it. I don't, you, I don't think you actually run clustering, but like you have this like cluster of, uh, you have this like, you, you have similar users and then you will recommend um, events based on what the similar users, uh, what the similar user profiles are signed up for. Um, and so that's a KNN classifier. Um, all right, well, so we have our requirements, so we can go ahead and hop straight into the diagram. Let's do that. Um, so we have uh, three requirements. We're gonna have um, that uh, users can sign up for events. We're going to have that users can um, add events, um, and we're going to have users can view um, recommended events. So we have here user uh, signs up for event. We have user. Um, adds event, and we have user um, views an upcoming event. This is where they're going to um, get recommendations of other, or um, I, it's it's um. So I imagine this is kind of like Facebook events. It should be on this like events page. Um, let's just maybe say uh, user viewing um, event. Uh, recommendations. There. Okay. Um, so when you sign up for that, you're going to record that in some kind of database for the events you'll be attending. You'll have a events database. Let's go ahead and start with this one. So we'll have an event creation backend service. We'll have that right over here. And we'll have just like a uh, events database where it'll um, store um, all the events that it's tracking. This will be the events database. So you enter the details for an event, you send it over to the backend. And there it goes to the database. 
that ACE is like, all right, 200 success. I've got your event. And then that returns to the client. Yep, it's created. Okay. And then um, when you're signing up for an event, let's say that you have an event sign up service. So we're going to have an event sign up service. And we'll have um, an event attendance database. This one is just kind of an event and the details for it as opposed to a, uh, a, a recording all the pairs of um, events to the um, users that will be attending. So this will be like an event tenants database. Uh, let's maybe talk about the schema for that one really quick, just because it might be a little bit confusing. And... So we will have the user ID. They can be signed up for multiple events. Uh, we'll say that their user ID is 3470. So for example, one of the events that they might be signed up for might have the event ID of um, 5672. Okay. And um, you might pull up a page that would be a key range query for all the events that you're signed up for. So I'm thinking that the partitioning key should probably be um, this one, we'll make this one the partitioning key. Oh, come on. And then that means the other one needs to be the sort key in order to make sure that all the uh, records are uniquely identified. And uh, so together they form the primary key for our database. Okay, let's get some arrows on there. So you have a user, they see an event, they wanna sign up for it. Uh, it's the back end. it has their user ID and the event ID that they just clicked on. Uh, you write it over here, and then that returns a 200 okay. You've persisted it properly. 200 okay, yep, you're uh, properly signed up. Okay, so we got both of these. Um, you're gonna have a Event recommendation service, that's what we'll use. Event recommendation service. Lots of longer names in these problems. Or I've gotten worse at naming things. Let's give it a little more space. This is gonna get crowded similarly to chapter 10 and 11 solution. Um, and uh, this is going to, so you have your user ID, you're pulling up the page for event recommendations. Um, so first it's going to retrieve some events and then we're going to go ahead and rank those events. So first we're going to do the um, event retrieval service. This could be merged with um, the uh, recommendation service. We'll see how it plays out in the book. There's plenty of different ways to do it. I really don't think any interviewer would actually care one way or the other. Um, it, it seems like an interview's services tend to go a lot more micro. Um, yeah. And then we have the event ranking service. So you have your user ID that you are sending over there. Let's go ahead and actually just mark that sending your user ID, and then that goes over to here. Got your user ID, and then we're going to find, um, it's just like events in your area. Um, so like, for example, if you're in the United States, it would not return uh, events in Brazil. It would assume that you uh, will not be um, willing to uh, you know, spend a um, thousand dollars just to be on a uh, in an event in some completely far away country. Um, I mean, if it, if it didn't filter by geolocation, you'd be returning all the events. So it would most you you probably just want to go ahead and just return stuff in your geo shard. Um, and so now we have a list of um, events that are filtered under some just um, normal settings. Um, and then we're going to return that over to here. Okay. 
And then we're going to have the event ranking service. We're going to send the list of events over there to get uh, ranked or filtered further. Just, um, I don't know if it's like one top event that it's supposed to return or if it's like ordered events or um, yeah, but uh, you'll send it over to an event ranking service. Uh, and that one will have a data model, a data model for it. Um, and then it should return um, events meeting some threshold value after it runs properly. Uh, and we'll dive into that more in a second or a minute. Events um, meeting some threshold value. Uh, we're filtering it. And then we're going to return the response over here of those um, filtered events. So we have the data model there. Um, and so we are going to use a, so it's going to be KNN. Um, I might not have dug into that a whole lot. So we're going to be doing user based collaborative filtering, nearest neighbor. Um, given similar users, what did they like? You're, you you might like it as well. Uh, so Kanan classifier. So it's a classifier. We're going to have to train it. Um, so we will need to do some training of our data model. Um, so we'll have a model training workers there. Okay, and we'll need a data warehouse where we are getting all of our training data. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you don't wanna do analytical queries on your OLTP databases. So we are gonna use um, some change data capture to uh, get it all persisted over there. I don't like how the formatting is on those lines. Okay, so CDC with um, the E triggers. So those are apparently perfectly fine. Um, there we go. And then this is going to pull in some uh, training data. So now it's going to get in there. Um, could be a longer process or more, I, I might be simplifying this a fair amount. Um, so we've got our data pulled in and we're going to train a specific model and then we're going to put it over into a model store, which will be a object store. So we're going to do a model store is a object store S3. You persist it there. And then at some point, you're going to run a deployment of that. You'll copy it onto uh, your prod machines. Uh, run a deployment. Okay, close enough. There we go. And then let's pull a model from here that we're going to put onto our horizontally scaled service. And it's going to go on each of the machines when we whenever we do the deployment. Um, and that'll put the model on each of the machines. Um, yeah, I want to do, I want to see what the input and output is of our data model. I was very annoyed that sources online were not super clear about that. And sometimes the, um, exact data format of it and what exactly it's using was not super clear. Um, so I don't want to be the bad guy like them. I want to actually make this a little bit more clear. I want, um, so we'll have a user ID and then it'll return the 
score commit. Um, so you might have a data model trained for each event. So you could even have this, uh, you could have like multiple um, worker uh, clusters set up, each with a different events um, classifier uh, that's trained. I feel like you might need to train a classifier per event because um, I don't think it can, you can train it to do multiple independent. So so there's, there's a difference between multi-class and like multi-task class where each class is independent. And this is where it would be each class is independent. Um, so you would have like a list possibly of multiple events that would um, meet the threshold or something, or um, you could order all the, the, the outputs if it's um, a value between a, a range of like zero and one or something like that. And you could like sort them all by its value and just return the top five or something events send it off to over there. Um, I was doing that thing with the square too. I've seen this a little bit online. And so I also wanna do this for clarity is that we're kind of taking an approach where it's the rows are users for how we're training it. And then the columns are um, user uh, features an event as the classification um, class. So um, that's that's the the training feature, the the thing that you're targeting is accurately predict the whether the event is whether they're signed up for the event or not. Um, this could have some skew on it. And so you might need to like downsample one side or the other, or you might be targeting um, just a, uh, it, that's something that definitely needs to be in um, the book somewhere. I'll go and have it, go ahead and write it here is that um, it's really important to cover um, performance measures. Um, so some important terms for that is, well, so first of all, uh, confusion matrix, which is for um, false positives versus uh, false negative rates. Um, depending on what you're targeting, um, you either want to target one versus the other. For example, with credit card fraud, you really do not want to have any fraud go through. It's okay to deny people um, being able to use their card uh, incorrectly, as in like you're you're like not letting them use their their card when they're um, actually good to go and they're they're the proper user and they're not committing fraud, it's okay to have a, a, a mistake made there and then they just have to use one of their other credit cards. But um, if you let fraud go through when it shouldn't go through, uh, that's a bigger deal and that's a huge loss. So uh, depending on on the problem domain, you're okay with one versus the other. And then there's different um, there's different uh, performance measures to kind of describe that is that um, there's um, accuracy, I think, there's recall. So sometimes if you have like a whole bunch of documents and you wanna make sure that you recall, uh, you, you're able to, um, you wanna get as many of those documents as possible. And it's okay if you um, also um, flag a couple of documents that are not actually what you want, but you wanna make sure that you get at least all the documents that are valid. Um, trying to get the biggest corpus, the, 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 uh, the most of your corpus of documents as possible. That's what recall is good for. Um, precision might be one. I think there's like F1 score or something. Um, yeah, there's like a couple of different performance measures. I'm not on top of it right now. I think um, scikit-learn is probably a really good resource for um, just like Google it and then in the documentation, um, it'll have something about uh, performance measures somewhere. It definitely has like this really nice built-in thing for the confusion matrix I've used before. Um, I'm not on top of it with the longer list of uh, performance measures right now, but that definitely needs to be in the book is um, performance measure coverage. Um, 
Okay. Uh, did I cover everything that I wanted to? I think so. I think we're good to go. Um, yeah, so this was chapter seven of the upcoming book, Bent Recommendation System. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, I'll see you guys next time. See ya.